Okay, then, talk number one. So I hope I'm producing their names, uh, pronouncing their names right. So we have Gorab and Bosidar from Pivotal uh, talking about Bosch links, a topic that is also kind of dear to my heart because like usually you not only have like one Bosch deployment, but then you have multiple ones and then you end up with questions around how are these beasts actually connected. So uh, just with that quick intro, handing it over to uh, the folks talking about the details there. Thank you very much. Um, so, brief introduction, you heard about us, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, a new development in Lynx called Lynx API. Oops, and this is us. So, this is Gorob, and I'm Bojidar. We work at Pivotal in the Toronto office, um, and we have experience on different teams in Cloud Foundry. So, a little bit about the background of Lynx. Um, Lynx was introduced to help operators reduce duplication across deployments um, and to provide arbitrary information. Uh, for example, instead of hard coding static IPs, wondering where you might securely store them, reducing uh, errors in operator duplication. Um, and this was introduced in May 2016. Since Bosch, sorry, thanks. Since Bosch uh, 255.5, and another uh, thing it can simplify is automated service service broker deployments. So you can have that functionality. Um, quick example, which most of you hopefully have used links and know about them. Um, there's essentially two types of links. You can have internal links within the same deployment. So within a job spec, you would declare the name of the link, the type of link, what properties it would provide. Uh, and you can have default options. You have consuming jobs, which again specify the name and type of link to consume. And you might have a consumer job template, such as a configuration file or something else that actually reads the link information and renders it into a template. And you have the deployment manifest, where if we examine, we can see the providing uh, jobs. Um, you can have aliases on the link, which uh, if there's multiple, for example, jobs, uh, which are databases, for example, front-end and back-end databases, uh, you will need aliases if they provide the same type of, of link. Um, the consuming job, on the other hand, would uh, reference that alias you provided. And as we'll see in the next slide, we'll see what happens uh, if you want to connect links across uh, deployments. Um, so this would be external links. Uh, similarly, provider and consumer job specs, you would define your link information. You would have a separate provider deployment and a separate consumer deployment, and they'll be much the same as we saw on the previous slide. Uh, one difference is in the consuming deployment, you would have to specify from which deployment you're consuming the link. And we have a similar job template as well in the consuming, uh, consuming job in the consumer deployment. Um, so moving on next, we'll talk a little bit about the motivation for Lynx API, the nature of the stock. Um, it was introduced to automatically share information uh, between different deployments, um, and those could be deployments not managed by the same director. Uh, you'll see examples of the API and how you can create links with it outside of deployment manifests. Uh, for link content, we still have much the same properties uh, that you would provide, um, but Lynx API also helps with uh, Bosch DNS. So you can have DNS addresses provided by the links instead of just IPs. Um, Lynx API also enables future development, so operators can better visualize um, how changing a link might affect deployments. Uh, 
who is consuming links, who is providing links within their foundation. Uh, a couple of our colleagues would be elaborating more on that in a separate talk, which we'll mention a little bit later on. So in terms of changing the link, uh, links API, better visualization would help you see what happens if a password changes port or AZs, for example. Um, so there's a couple of issues. For example, how do changes propagate? Um, with the existing links, there's less awareness of uh, the changes, the impact the changes to uh, link definition or link provi uh, providing a link, uh, what the changes would be. And there might be, there's less information about potential downtime because unless you manually go and, or you know the deployments which consume the link, you might not know uh, how much downtime there could be if uh, a link changes. Oops. And the current solution to with the existing links is redeploying the consumers of the link to get the new information after the link is updated. So links API uh, was and currently is still under development. It's mostly stable. Um, and by that I mean it has been developed for uh, about a year, I think. Uh, there's still, you know, small updates going on. Uh, and there's talk about links API v2. Um, so visualization, which I briefly touched upon, is one application with uh, the new links API. Uh, operators can better calculate uh, the footprint of the links, how many consumers of the link are there, uh, so they can better gauge downtime. Um, links API allows link creation outside of the manifests. So if you have the appropriate uh, credentials to make the API call, you can create a link and, for example, get the address of a service instance that, um, you know, and, and start using it outside of a deployment or within a deployment not managed by the same director. Uh, links API allows monitoring link consumers. And now I'll pass it off to Gorup to talk about some of these updates and how Links API helped reimagine links. Uh, thank you, Boz. Uh, so the main problem with previous link operations was uh, mostly the component that's associated with the link were generated during runtime, and the changes that are getting propagated between various deployments or within the same deployments, there is no state management for that. So except if it's a cross-deployment link, then your deployment itself used to contain the link contents as part of the deployment, and we used to store it. But this caused like, lots of issues in terms of like, multiple regeneration of the same component for the link and uh, other properties which was redundant. So in order to uh, refactor this whole thing, we considered certain topics like uh, what are the common properties within the instance groups that are taken under consideration for not getting like recalculated every time you deploy. So we fragmented the whole link component into various sections. So now we have uh, link providers. They have their own intents. Then we have link consumers. And their association generates a link. So whenever we have a consumer that is associating with the provider, it's considered as a link. And rather than associating it, uh, like adding this whole, whole component and replicating it again and again on each instance, we associate it with the instance uh, as a separate table. So it's only the association that is being replicated all the time, not the actual component. So it also reduces uh, the amount of calculation time that is required for your deployment significantly, because uh, calculation of link itself is very costly. So. As previously said, what is a provider? So instead of uh, the intent of the provider, so we kind of reimagine the whole intent of what provider and consumer might be. So provider is basically 
whatever properties you want to expose, either externally or internally, that are part of the provider components. So uh, your properties, uh, if you don't want to actually expose any properties, but just the IPs, you can still create like blank providers that will just expose the IP addresses or the DNS addresses or instance IDs of your uh, instance. And uh, that can be either consumed within the same deployment or externally by the APIs. So other, uh, other consumers can actually know about just your IPs, not the additional properties. And similar to that is like consumer, you define, your, your job can just specify a consumer and list what are the properties that you want to consume and Bosch will just consume whatever, Bosch will just add all the properties that you have specified in the consumer and uh, update your deployment. So there are a couple of uh, objects associated by default for each links. One of them is address that gives you like the DNS entries of, uh, of the link that you have called for. So this address can be either IP and a DNS, sorry, uh, either IPs or a DNS based on the provider deployment. So if the provider explicitly says I just want to deploy with IPs, then when you query this address it would be just IPs, not the address, DNS address. Then you can filter out based on AZs also. Then there is like, P level uh, P processes associated P accesses associated with like each link. So if your link is providing multiple properties, uh, you can query those properties based on like uh, name of your property, and this will actually uh, pull out your uh, provider and extract the properties from it. And then you can also uh, list instances associated with it. And each instance have some default properties inside them. Uh, like the name associated with them, IDs, index, uh, AZs. So AZs is, uh, you can specify multiple AZs, so it can actually uh, use it as an R operators, and based on the AZs you have specified, it will give you one of them. And also you can specify like which instance is your bootstrap node. So it will give you like a Boolean value based on like is the current instance a bootstrap instance or not. So this property is basically used by most of the cluster environments where uh, your initial node need to know that it, it is the first node in the cluster and it does some configuration based on like which one is your initial uh, instance. So based on all this reimagination, we introduced API and I think it's, uh, Bosch will go forward and like add more details on what this API endpoint might look like and what are the properties associated with them. Thank you, Gaurab. So we sped through the first beginning, which hopefully most of you knew about, the you know examples of links and uh, the, the properties that Gaurab talked about, they're also listed on Bosch IO. So um, the, the, this presentation is also posted on the schedule website if you wanted to refer to it after. In terms of the new links APIs, uh, this table shows the different API endpoints that there are, and we'll go into more detail about each one. So there's a few get uh, endpoints, which can list providers, consumers, uh, links within a deployment, and the addresses uh, that those links provide. Uh, there's one post endpoint at the moment to create a link, and one delete endpoint to delete a link. Uh, at the moment, these APIs require admin privileges. Uh, we'll talk about how this might change with Links API v2. So jumping into the first one, listing the link providers. Um, in terms of request parameters, you provide your deployment name and you would get a response similar to this, listing the providers and some metadata about them in that deployment. Similarly for consumers, the query parameters are again deployment name and you get a similar response about all the consumers within the deployment. Uh, the third endpoint is listing links. So within the deployment again, you get a response with metadata. Uh, the 
the IDs here are, are important and they tie back to responses from the previous APIs. So you have provider ID and consumer ID, uh, as well as the link ID uh, for each, each entry. Jumping into the post, so assuming we all have the right credentials and we provide the right parameters, which are link provider ID and uh, the name of the new consumer. Uh, this is an arbitrary uh, name uh, type, should be always passed in as external. Uh, we, if we post this, a new link would be created and you receive uh, the ID of the new link that was created. Uh, at the moment, there is an AP, only an API endpoint to retrieve the link address. Um, it requires you to pass the link ID, uh, so which you might get from querying all the links in a deployment or you have it from a link you just created. Uh, there is an optional parameter about AZs and this, um, you can provide the name of one AZ or multiple. And you can also filter by health status and uh, here are some of the values which are accepted. Uh, as a response, you would get the DNS of the link and for all of these examples, we use a relatively new feature of the Bosch CLI, uh, Bosch Curl, which has been available since uh, Bosch CLI 5.3.1. Uh, lastly, how to delete links. Uh, there's uh, an API endpoint to delete, and it will only act on links which were created using the links API. So if you try to delete uh, a link which is consumed and provided within the manifests, like the old style links. Um, I'm using old and, you know, just as a word, they're, they're certainly still being used. Um, if you try to use it with an ID of an existing link that was not created with the API, the, the request will fail. Um, so this endpoint only deletes external links created through the API. Uh, you get these response codes uh, in various scenarios. Uh, if it is successful, you get 204. Um, we'll briefly touch upon some of the improvements coming up in Lynx API v2, uh, for which work is currently ongoing. Um, one is improved authorization for endpoints. So as I previously mentioned, you usually you need to be the admin user right now to successfully list endpoints and create new links using the API. Uh, in V2, you would have more deployment or team-specific uh, permissions, so it's a little more granular. There's a new uh, instances endpoint, um, and details about all of these can be found in the Bosch Notes repository. Uh, we'll have a link to that at the end of the presentation. And as usual, you can reach out to the Bosch team on the open source Slack, so you can participate in the conversation about the direction of Lynx API v2 and share, you know, what's going well, what's not going well. One thing worth mentioning, which is connected in, in a way to Lynx API, is Lynx and variables. Um, the, so the recent work around this area um, allows variables to provide part of themselves. Uh, right now it's only limited to certificates, uh, but for example, they can provide the SAN or uh, common names portions of a generated certificate, uh, and this could be consumed within links. Uh, in a similar fashion, links could be consumed within variables as well. And we'll, we'll see an example coming up next. Uh, this is still under development, uh, but uh, it has been the basic functionality has been available since uh, Bosch Director 267. So to show you as an, exa as an example of this, um, let's see, I think that's all of it. We have the usual variable section, and as you can see, this is a generated certificate which uh, consumes an alter alternative name from uh, a link. And this could be used within 
service brokers, for example. Um, and now I'll pass it off to Gorab to talk about this application of links. Thank you. Uh, so there are like various use cases of this API endpoint that were like taken into consideration. For, first of uh, the most important was uh, designing it for the service brokers. So like any service broker which is not ex maintained within Bosch environment or within CF, they can actually query the endpoint and create links for it for the components which resides within the Bosch world and uh, and share those content to like uh, different components which the service broker itself is managing or is aware of, so that a component that resides within the Bosch world and outside the Bosch world can like talk to each other. Um, and then it's also not kind of helps kind of, uh, decoupling like your service instances from your app instances, so any changes on the service instances which is managed outside Bosch world can be done separately to the app instance managed by a different world, so it's act, act like a glue point where you can uh, create an external links and then uh, specify those link properties to an app which help you not co-locate it in, within the same ecosystem. Uh, and based on like changes uh, on one, one side of uh, changes in Bosch, it's kind of non-impacted to, to the app. And uh, with the feature of DNS, uh, which, which is already there in Bosch, uh, the links that are created, the addresses associated with them is like a DNS address. So rebinding app is going to be like significantly non-problematic anymore because the address that is associated with the service instances or the links are, if it's DNS, then you don't have to like rebind your app every time you redeploy your service. So lesser downtime for your app and you can manage your services better in the background without impacting any app changes. And another very significant uh, use case of uh, this API endpoint was visualization. Uh, it helped us understand what your deployment is actually exposing when you have like something like CF uh, deployment which has like 90 instances group or 19 instances and like 15 to 20 instance group, it's significantly uh, troubling to see what links are being provided and what properties associated with the links are being exposed. And uh, you're not aware like, is there any security issues with like exposing your password to this endpoint? So this visualization will help you, uh, this API endpoint can help you understand like what are the properties that you're exposing to, to external world or outside Bosch or within Bosch environment. Uh, and it also help us understand, uh, help, help us understanding like what are the consumer, uh, what are the consumers and uh, the, the producers associated with the deployments are doing and what they are sharing. And for the better visualization details and what it might actually look like, you can go to our colleague's talk, which is in Delhi room at 2.30. And uh, another use case was deployment impact changes. So with, with the API endpoint, you can kind of calculate the footprint of your changes in your, your deployment that can cause within the foundation. So if there is a single password change, it might look very insignificant for you because it's just your own app, but if 30 other deployments are consuming your, your properties, then its impact footprint is like significantly increased. But as a developer, you are always unaware of this footprint. Like if changes in your property, what significant changes other deployment might have to do to consume it. So this will give you a better impact calculation before you make any changes. And you can basically also uh, communicate with like other consumers saying like, hey, we are like changing this property. This is not going to be called port anymore. It's called super port now. So this type of changes can be easily shared with like other teams and you can better manage either downtimes or any other thing associated with the deployment. And 
On-demand brokers can now create links, multiple uh, links for the same service instance. So they can share the same, uh, they can filter out what properties they can, uh, they want to share. Either you can request for a single AZ, if your service instance, supposedly, if your service instance is deployed in three AZs structure, and you want just app A to associate with AZ1, so you can filter out which uh, instance you can, you want to associate with the app, with like just filtering the AZs. So these are like case studies for uh, for Links API, and I guess now it's the demo time. So the setup that we did for the demo was we have two different Bosch director, and we are using MySQL uh, deployment to share like cluster changes, and we are deploying two different MySQL clusters, and then with the Links API endpoint, creating uh, external links from director one to two, and this will uh, give you the link and the properties that are actually required for your cluster to communicate with each other, and yeah, I think, and since live demos are always very risky, we have a recording. Okay. So, Bosch. So, right. Okay, so at this point we have a uh, director one that is Bosch 1, and another director on the left side, Bosch uh, 2. So first one is already deployed with the cluster environment of MySQL, uh, and we have two running instances on it. So what we're gonna do is see uh, what are the properties, what are the links, links provider associated, associated with them, with the API endpoint, and this will give you a list of all the providers uh, that are there in the deployment one, so the uh, the provider we actually want to consume is is need to be shared. So if the shared flag is not turned on on your provider, then creating a link uh, f with this provider association will will cause issues and uh, you will get an error. So for an example, we have selected this one because the shared flag is like false for this. So if you try to create a provider with this, it will fail. So now we have selected uh, like another uh, another property, which is shared. Yeah. So that was the property that we want to create as a link associated with it. So the ID associated with it is 27. Uh, so in the down screen, we will now try to create a link with the payload. So we got an error for that. And now when we change the IDs associated with that to 27, it should actually create a link for you. So these are the link properties. Uh, this is actually the link content. So we filtered out the link content in order to see like what are the properties that are being exposed and what are the properties that you get by default for each link. So you have instances, you have like addresses associated with each instance. Since we are explicitly specifying static IPs, so you only see IPs here. 
and uh, other properties that we have mentioned in our previous slides like uh, AZs, bootstrap nodes or not. So for this, one of the, one of the instance bootstrap node is true, another for is false. And other properties associated, and other link properties that are associated with this. So we'll just use this. Property. So the property that we have, we want was just the Galera cluster uh, health properties, and we just update these properties in our manifest too. So you're going to deploy the second cluster. So we, for time saving, we already updated all the properties within that. So we're going to just deploy at this point. And before that, we were like checking cluster one to see if the instance are getting uh, connected or not with the changes in property. So we can see now from the previous uh, uh, from the previous state, now you see the cluster size increasing to three from two at this point. And parallelly, there is like deployment going on. So as soon as you get like updated instance. Uh, they started connecting back to this cluster even though they are being managed by two different Bosch directors. So you can have downtime in one of the clusters and still apps running because the cluster is still fine and managed by a different Bosch director. This update takes time based on the IS. So we're gonna just skip because I think we are running out of time. So just in order to see if the clusters, if, if the Glera command is actually lying to you or not, we created like tables in cluster one and it should automatically get synced to cluster two without any changes because now the cluster is like connected to each other. So we create a table in one cluster and queried it on the second cluster. So we can see uh, a table getting, uh, your database getting created on the cluster two. And when you add entries to this, this database, like if you add entries, you should see So if you add, uh, insert a value into cluster one, it should get synced to cluster two. Yeah, that should be it for the demo. I think we are done for that. So yeah, the last slide is uh, just some resources uh, which you can access um, from the presentation uploaded to the website. Um, I think we've got maybe a minute or two for some questions. Thank you very much.